Hello, and welcome back for another uh, interview episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. I'm excited. This is well, I'll save the I'll save the bio for the bio part. <laughs> I have I have Mike Young on the line, and he is a lawyer who has specialized in working with copywriters, including direct response businesses and online businesses. And Mike, welcome. And I want to I want to just start with this question: What would you say is the biggest legal risk that every copywriter, novice or pro, needs to watch out for when it comes to just the copywriting process and getting it out the door? Uh, you're right. One of the biggest risks that I see, and it's very common, is the misuse of swipe files. And what I mean by that is somebody takes a swipe file and uses it on behalf of a client or on behalf of their own products and services they're selling and writing copy for, and they misuse it. And the next thing you know, they're getting a claim against them for intellectual property theft. Um, many copywriters don't understand that just because you have access to somebody else's copy that's great that converts, you can't borrow that, repurpose it for your own. You know, the worst ex <laughs> the worst examples you see of that is somebody that takes a letter from one of the greats like a, a Gary Halbert, a Ben Savanga, a John Carlton, a Garfinkel. And, you know, the, the ones that out there that's always at the very top of the list that everybody's always seen and said, okay, I'm going to find and replace my product and put it in there and throw it online and sell. Those are just, that's <sighs> awful. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot more nuance to that, too. You know, even if you find a paragraph that you like of that type of thing, you know, people misunderstand what the concept of fair use is. But intellectual property theft is the biggest thing. And I understand people was like, well, I found it online. There was a big site that said swipefile.com or swipefile.org or swipefile.co. Just because you can find it online and you can download it doesn't mean that you can use it and misuse it on behalf of yourself or, or on behalf of clients. Uh, uh, there, yeah. somebody, somebody owns that copyright. You know, so it's uh, people are like, well, well, it's fair use for me to use it. I'm, I'm going to just pull out parts of it and use it. Well, that's not the case either. These are the proven direct response, marketing, copywriting, and entrepreneurship success strategies you can use today to write your own ticket and create the life you want. I am Roy Furr, and this is Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Now, here's today's breakthrough. Yes. <laughs> well, let's let's dive deeper into that. And I even okay. have a fun, fun little horror story to tell. But first, I need to give like the bio. So uh, Mike Young, he's the author of and this is this is how I found you. Like I was looking through best selling books on Amazon about copywriting, marketing, that sort of thing. You know, yeah, a lot of them, it's just like, I don't want to talk to that person. I don't want to talk to this person. But then I saw bulletproof your copywriting 12 sales copy legal dangers and how to avoid them. And this is super important. But it's also something that a lot of us don't have the credibility to talk about. You do, and the experience. Um, because for the past 16 years, Mike has provided legal representation for many A-list and B-list copywriters. And in addition to the legal side of things, he also understands direct response copywriting, writes copy for his own businesses that, that he owns and co-owns. Uh, he's also an active angel investor in seed and pre-seed startups and is deeply involved in issues unique to the online and direct response business world, including important issues like copyright and compliance. And I look forward to diving into all that stuff with you. So um, kind of a horror story in that regard. I was I was working as a copy chief for one of my clients, and we did this thing, the spec challenge, you're probably familiar with it, mm -hmm. um, where we're asking people to write a little bit of sample copy to give us a sense of how they're going to write going forward. And this guy submitted this copy and I was, I, I was reading it and it was for an investment product. And I was like, there are some really bit, really great chunks of copy in here, right? Like really, really powerful chunks of copy, but it like didn't make sense together. And it felt like it was talking about an investment market that was not the current investment market. And it was like, how does this person write such good copy that's also so off in these different ways. And so I started Googling like sentences out of it. And I'm like, there's some Clayton McPeace, there's some uh some some Gary Bensvinga, there's some like all of these very successful financial promotions. And I was like, oh. So then I actually go to him and I'm like, dude, you can't, you can't do this, right? Like, and and he went off on a rant on me and he's like, this is how all the great copywriters write. How do you like with, and then he ended up calling the client's customer service department and like have it doing this big, basically the guy got blacklisted from working with financial publishers as a result of this. Wow. Um, yeah. You, it, it really, it really doesn't work. And the better a marketer the client is, or in the more competitive marketplace, the more likely you are to end up in trouble. Um, <laughs> so, so 
Um, I, I'm going to kind of combine the next two questions because we've kind of gotten into this already. So um, what are kind of the biggest mistakes copywriters make when using swipe files? If you want to add to anything from the intro, but then like, how can we, how can we use swipe files legally, ethically without getting into trouble? Well, it, it, we already discussed it as far as being able to use, you know, the, the words of it. I mean, one of the things about the copyright is it's the ways an idea is expressed. So, you know, you know, for example, a book is written in a certain way, you know, J.K. Rowling writes Harry Potter books different than James Patterson writes murder mysteries. Gary Bensavinga writes his style of copywriting very different than Gary Halbert used to write his. Uh, these yes. are the types of things when you take a look at them that you almost recognize, you know, as an experienced copywriter, you, know, you understand this when you take a look at it, you know what the different styles are, make these, et cetera. And, you know, it's not swiping somebody else's thing there is one, it's not going to convert as well. And two, you're just committing intellectual property theft, <laughs> you know? So the great thing about us swipe files, which, you know, some people, you know, yes, it requires work is it's the idea thing. It's the idea flow. You take a look. If, if you're in the same or similar niche that you're writing for, you can take a look at this and say, what are the big themes here, the big worries? What is it that's driving this that's causing it to convert? And those are the types of things that you can pull out of swipe files and get the gut reaction from it and then express in your own words, not through an article spinner, not using the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the AI GPT chatbot that's everybody's raving about right now online. These are yeah. the, you, you, we're, we're, we're not to go through there and do this and, and create a derivative work from somebody we're using our own creative personality to say these ideas may have some merit here from my my audience these pain, pain points or whatever pressure points that we want to apply to how can we express it best using our own words yeah you know i i had a revolution a revelation right before i um i became uh like a full-time freelance copywriter that um, and it was something I picked up from Clayton Makepeace when he passed out this 20 point, pretty darn good copy outline. And I had this revelation that, that when we start to learn copywriting and we hear people talking about swipe files, like it's talked about almost like the words are spells that you have to cast. And it's like, <laughs> if you're a Harry Potter fan, it's not Wingardium Leviosa, it's Wing, Wingardium Leviosa, right? <laughs> And, and it's not like the headline is is like that, where it has to be that specific combination of words. It's no. the ideas behind it. Mm-hmm. And and it's I, I fell on this concept called like the deep structure, right? And so mm-hmm. it's always it's it's not like how are they saying it? Because you can look at a book that's a hundred years old and it ha- it can have lots of great deep structure to the the persuasive mm-hmm. messages, but language from a hundred years ago feels very different than language from today. Yeah. Right. So you, you can say like, okay, how did Robert Collier write his letters? Like what was he doing? What idea was he starting with and continuing and continuing? And, and that really is the best way to learn to write great copy. Right? Absolutely. Um, that's, that's excellent. It's, it's so not just because Roy says learn the deep structure, but because Mike says you're going to get sued if you, copy people learn to use swipe files like a teacher <laughs> yeah. uh yeah so um so you've talked about intellectual property ownership and this is something mm-hmm. that um that i learned fairly early on in my career but maybe not everybody understands um obviously if if we're talking about a piece of copy that like clayton wrote for weiss research mm-hmm. um i don't own that copy right i know yeah. that but if i'm writing for a client uh who owns that copy? Is it the co- is it me? Is it the client? Can you kind of explain what that process looks like and and how ownership is decided? I would say, unfortunately, at about ninety percent of copywriting gigs, nobody knows. You should know. You should you know you, it should be in writing. It should be agreed to with the client as to who owns what. But most times, it's it's kind of left out there. Oh, we're going to do this. This is what we're going to do. This is you know this is the gig. Here's the terms of compensation. But, you know, who actually owns what? Both parties generally come out and well, the copyright's like, well, I, can, I own it. I'm going to recycle it somewhere else. And the, and the client's like, it's mine. I paid for it. You know, you, it's no different than if you were, you know, a grunt employee working for me at minimum wage. It's mine. You, you know, it's, it's a work for hire. So, I mean, yes. you, know, you know, what I like to do with my clients or whatever is let's get this firm there. Now, it, usually you can find an agreement that both parties can live with that works well. Uh, you know, for example, you know, you can have it where the copywriter owns everything. The client owns everything. But I prefer, obviously, when I'm representing copywriters, 
that the copywriter does. Now, yes. when you when you own it, then you know so it's like, well, then how can the copy the client use it if the copywriter retains ownership? You license it. It's a yes. you know, and, and and at that point in time, you know, the, the client's like, you know, here you go, you can use this, you know, and I'll you know, oftentimes there's an agreement that you're not going to, as a copywriter, recycle it with a competitor simultaneously. Yes. Um, you know, and this or, is you know, all like firmly established in intellectual property law, yes, like and, and not just for our advertising copy for any kind of creative work, right? Absolutely. The intellectual property. This is this is this is hundreds of years of background for different types of intellectual property. You know, yeah. you know we now it applies to software. I mean, there's a lot of things that it does. But in this case, you know, people are like, well, what if the client, for example, wants to absolutely own it? They insist they want to own it. Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a few options that said I like to recommend. One is okay, then. You pay me three times my normal thing and you own it all. You know, that, that's yeah. the, 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 you know, you know, pay a premium if you want total ownership client, but do you really want that or do you need it? You know, particularly if I can give you a license and promise that not going to compete against you with it or get or sell it to one of your competitors. And another option here is with the clients, well, I need to, I have to own it for whatever reason. It's like, okay, I'll transfer ownership to you and we'll put this per agreement. But at a certain period of time, for example, when you quit using any of your own advertising, you agree to revert and transfer the copyright ownership back to me as the copywriter. Does that yes. make sense? Yes. So yeah, that you're absolutely. able to you're able to repurpose it, so it's not lost and wasted. If the client uses it for a marketing campaign for six months to a year and decides to go in a different direction, that copy is worth something. It should not just be wasted. Yeah, and so there 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 are lots of different contexts where what what works can be negotiated, I think, with mm -hmm. with good understanding and, and good legal counsel. Um, I, I know that a lot a lot of work that I've done with like big publishers, um, they they're not going to let me own the sales copy, yeah. but a lot of more entrepreneurial businesses do. And it's it's about understanding that. A lot of times, um, like even it is in the contract where it says the client gets ownership, it's done as work for hire, but as long as they're using it, I'm going to get a uh, a royalty based on the, yeah. the uh, results generated. Um, in other contexts, like for example, if you were to do, um, let's say lead generation for dentists, because there's dentists everywhere, they need leads or like a, a patient reactivation campaign or something. It does not make sense to give each dentist ownership of the copy. Otherwise, you can't do an area exclusive program across the entire country where you're saying, okay, you have permission, you have permission, you have permission, as long as I don't sell it to somebody in your competing market. Um, and then if no, if there's no contract involved, <laughs> then it's a mess, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, like, um, so there, should, a, a, oh. chain of email, a chain of emails is a disaster. I mean, if you're like, if that's your agreement, it's a disaster because memories fade as to what those emails exactly meant. And, and there's yes. going to be a lot of things that are missing from those emails. Yes. Um, and and um, yeah, and, and there's a lot of stuff that you that you, that you learn the more contracts and agreements you go through. So should I, maybe maybe this is an obvious answer to this question, but should should a copywriter ever agree to do copywriting work without a written contract or written agreement? I would say almost never. And the only part that I've seen exceptions for that too is the person who's just working on the small Fiverr type things just to get yeah. at the at the beginning. If there's so minimal amount involved, like you know, for a hundred bucks, I'll write your, your your one email or whatever it is. Th yes. those type of things, you know. You know, it's a risk thing. You know, as a lawyer, I have to say, well, yes, you should get one for everyone. But as a practical matter, the economics of that are such that it's probably not going to make sense for you to sit there and haggle out a contract over something where if you just walked away from it, you wouldn't lose any sleep over a bad deal. Yeah. And I and I think that, um, you know, one thing that that um, maybe a lot of people who do work through those sites or hire people through those sites don't pay as much attention to is you are actually doing a huge written agreement. It's just not necessarily between the two parties. It's between yeah. the third party. Um, so um, adding on to that, like contracts can sometimes feel like a bear to read through. And I make it a habit, especially, well, I'm, I make it a habit for, for any contract involving work for hire that I'm going to read every word of that contract, even if I just signed a contract with that client a couple months ago, right? Or a couple yeah. of weeks ago, I'm still going to read through. Um, and through time, I've developed a, a fairly substantial understanding of contract language. I've even ended up with, you know, contracts sent off to lawyers and primarily they're justifying their fee by making a couple tiny edits. Sorry, not a, not a knock <laughs> against you, but um, 
I, it's it's like I've, I have a careful understanding of contract language. So how does it serve copywriters to develop that careful understanding? And like, is there any major points or any major components of the contract that, that we should all make sure we we know? Well, some of the biggies on that, first of all, not only is it intellectual property ownership, which we've just been discussing and how that's addressed, but things that can inadvertently prevent you from competition. You know, it's like, you know, a lot of these contracts will have a boilerplate thing in there of saying you're doing nothing in this field for the next, you know, two, three, five years. You know, yeah. and, it, and, and it may have been intended they pulled it out of a contract for something else to avoid a competition thing. But suddenly you're looking at you signed an agreement as a copywriter. Let's say you did something in nutritional supplements focusing on the United States market. And suddenly you're doing you sign off an agreement on this and you didn't look down and paragraph 27 says that for three years you're agreeing that you will not do any any work whatsoever after you terminate this contract for three years in the nutritional supplement field in the United States. Yeah. 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 You know, it doesn't matter how much money you're getting paid, you just kneecap yourself. Yeah, absolutely. So so definitely any anything that, that says non-compete or competitive work clause or anything like that um is it you you have to be very careful. And and by the way, like I can tell copywriters this most of these clauses are negotiable. Now yes. you may not get exactly what you want, but most of them are negotiable. And I found at least with most good marketers, something like the non-compete, they'll say, oh, sorry, that was in there from something else, right? Like yeah. they'll just delete it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, indemnification is another one. You know, you really don't want to be on the hook for indemnifying them in case something goes wrong because chances are they're going to try to pass the buck to you for something they screwed up on in their marketing campaign. So, you know, yeah. you don't want you don't want an identification thing and they're saying you're agreeing to identify, defend and pay their attorney's fees if they get sued because something screwed up during the campaign. Yeah, uh, that's it. Now, what about what about the other way? Um, because because in in some cases, um, especially some of the big publishers uh, have. Well, they'll, they'll have things like. If if it as long as the work is not found to be in violation of let's say the copyright clause in the contract, the yeah. client agrees to indemnify and hold harmless the copywriter for uh, work and performance of this. Um, is is that something that a copywriter should push for to have where the client indemnifies them? I would argue so to the extent that they actually can, and particularly if it's a larger one. If it's a smaller guy, if you've got a small, for example, internet marketer that's done fairly well for themselves, but they're earning, say, for example, they're earning five hundred thousand to a million dollars a year, yeah. chances are they're not going to have the assets as they're ramping up. Even if they've paid you a, decently for a copy, they're not going to have the assets to indemnify or defend you for anything if this, it goes horribly wrong. <laughs> I mean, you can put it yeah. in there, but, you know, but good luck. You're better off having business liability insurance to cover you in case there's a claim instead. Okay. Okay. And and so um, business liability insurance is something that um, is worth looking at for. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, now, a dispute resolution would be another one I would, uh, would insist upon okay. how it's being done and where it's being done. You know, choice of law between the United States generally is fairly common. You know, California isn't that much different than New York or Texas or that you first for the, st the type of law that's covering it. But you know, let's say, for example, you're in Lincoln, Nebraska, yeah. and you're working for a client in New York City. Do you want to have all disputes handled in courts in Brooklyn? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that becomes expensive very quickly. Even if you're right, you're wrong because it's going to. Your travel budget business, and everything you, else. Yeah. Travel budget and everything else. So I always like to encourage people to have you know dispute resolution things such as online mediation, uh, arbitration, those type of things, and try to uh, and ideally put in such a place that you're not going to incur significant expense if you have to go through dispute. So it's interesting. I, I mean, you mentioned online mediation, and probably in the last well since early 2020, there's probably been a, a lot more of that showing up in in contracts than than prior. I know that a lot of contracts are. For some of these bigger companies, it's it's essentially the same copywriter contract as it was in in ninety five, right? Yeah. Um, okay, and, and they should be adverse to that. I would think, because as a first step, if nothing else is, you know, bringing a third party to help you amicably resolve it, so you all aren't heading to court. Most people are yeah. reasonable about that. Even a big company is like, you know, we'd much rather yeah. have it settled than go to court. Yes, absolutely. Is there any other? Um, major parts of the contract language that we should uh, understand or or functions of the contract? 
Well, I mean, so sometimes it's just the business things. For example, you know, if, you know, a newbie copywriters make this mistake of backending their compensation. You know, if this is a business thing, just like every, you know, if you're in business as a copywriter, you want to make sure one, you get paid as much upfront as you can, and two, in some instances, just understand that your royalties are gravy. You know, you want to make sure there's a way for you to track it if it's on a percentage basis. You know, like you know what, you know, X amount up front plus you know five percent over a period of time for the campaign. You know you want to make sure there's a way to track that so that, you know, the books aren't cooked. I mean, uh, you know, I've seen yeah. some pretty creative things that are that are worthy of Hollywood movie <laughs> studios as far as how they can cook the books and say, oh, we lost money on this and you're not entitled to a royalty. So well, just understand, you know, yeah. my understanding is Hollywood movie studios are the best at actually. Doing absolutely. That absolutely. <laughs> but, but I've seen some, but I've seen some for copywriting. That's almost as good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I, I that's, that's, um, I, I always want to make sure at least that there's some kind of audit clause in the contract yes. that that I, I have permission to edit. Um, and the other thing, I mean, for all of these in terms of copywriter client work, working with clients that you certainly have reason to trust, well, certainly do not have reason to distrust and hopefully have reason to trust uh, goes a long way towards helping you out, even even in, in deciding what the contract is going to say in the negotiation process. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, cause, cause weasels will find a way to weasel. <laughs> yes. If there's red yeah. flags there on the front end, there's going to be, you don't be surprised on the back end. If you, you know, you know, something happens that you really don't like. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's move unless there's additional uh, contract no, items fine. that are, okay. Um, how, how else can you get yourself in, in trouble through, through copywriting? <laughs> there are so many ways, but making claims is the biggest one. I mean, making the wrong type of claims uh, or how you make the claims, I should say. Um, the biggest areas, of course, you know, are, are consumer markets. I mean, if you if it's B2C and you're writing for it, you can assume that you have in the United States alone, you have the Federal Trade Commission. You know, if it's uh, health related, probably the FDA. If it's uh, securities related or whatever, you may have the SEC involved. Then you also have your state attorney generals, consumer protections, and there's 51 attorney generals out there. You know the, the 50 states plus the DC has that. You know they all have their consumer protection bureaus that want to go after you as well. So B to C is a much higher risk, particularly if you're dealing with health and monetary claims. You know weight loss. Yes. You know make money online. You know my product or service will help you do one of those things. You know those are the these are the big things that you have an issue with you know and some people are like well we'll just put atypical results disclaimers in there that doesn't work at least since 2009 as far as the ftc is concerned you may find yeah. you know a small state that an attorney general might agree to it or mitigate the damages they're coming after you for by saying well at least you put atypical results disclaimers on there saying we made these claims but these are atypical results so you shouldn't rely upon them well, that's that doesn't cover it. You can't give in the big print and then take away in the fine print, and that's yes. that's a, that's a big issue. Um, and, and, and I guess part of it, which many copywriters still don't understand, is the um, how they take a look at this when you, there's claims made. For example, let's say you sell a nutritional supplement to you know, bottles of weight loss pills, and you, ten thousand customers. Three of them provide glowing reviews and said, you know, and based on those glowing reviews, you can point to them and say, these people lost like 65 pounds. You yeah. know, and you and it's documented, it's credible. I mean, there's no doubt this is what happened if these people took these bills. Yeah. Um, the FTC and many state attorney generals will assume the other 9,997 either got no results or gained weight after taking those bills. So you can't, you know, make the claim based upon the three and say, you know, you know, because there's an assumption out there that everybody else got no results or negative results. Um, yeah. so, so it's like, how do you deal with that when you're writing copy? Well, you know, you, ideally you got scientific studies you can rely upon, but, you know, let's be practical. And many times your client is not going to be able to pay for that, nor do they have the time to do if they want to get to market. Um, so you, if you can, that's great. And you can even hijack some, you know, for your product if you want to from other things. You know, let's say, for example, you know, you know, scientists from Harvard found that if you walk 30 minutes a day, you know, you, that it decreased your risk of a heart attack by X percent. You know, yes. you can hijack that and bring it in as a, as, as a statistic to support something that you're selling as a walking device. Yes. Yeah. You Absolutely. can't say you can't say that Harvard says your walking device 
causes this to happen, but you let the let the prospective customer make the uh, the jump, the le- the logical leap there. Um, yeah, case- I mean that, that that whole piling on the proof and credibility and using scientific stuff, you have to you have to be very careful with it. But the more that you can back up every claim that you make with with if there's if there's some related study, if there's some related proof, if there's some related, uh, not even necessarily talking about your product, but some related um, statement. Yes. Um, and and we'll, we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But but if if you know the the Harvard Business Journal says that copywriting is the absolute best work at home opportunity, um, then if we're talking about copywriting, we can say Harvard Business Journal's favorite work at home opportunity, right? Yes. And there's credibility there. And a case studies, I, I really enjoy, you know, you know, recommending with clients and whatever when they're writing stuff. And case studies, if you can get them to it. But the the key part to this when you're doing that and explaining, for example, we were talking about the people who lost the 65 pounds or whatever. Yes. Put in all the key facts that were there. For example, let's say they did take the pills. They also worked out two hours a day in the gym. They were also on a 1500 calorie a day restricted diet. You know, these yes. are the types of things. And what you know, they happen to be 20 two years old with a great metabolism versus being 65 and not so great metabolism. These are all yeah. the key facts that somebody should want to know before they can make an informed purchase based upon it. And so, you know, my thing is, you know, it's, if it's a case study, it's a complete case study. And you don't just say in there, make that claim of you'll lose 65 pounds, but you let the customer or prospective customer make the mental leap saying, here's where they were, here's where they were, and here's what it took for them to get there. Yeah. So if if that, that that seems to be a big thing that um it's it is one thing to tell the complete and accurate story of a single person it is another thing completely to say because that person got xyz result you will get xyz result. Exactly. Okay. Excellent. Um yeah and and stories and case studies are are excellent copy devices. You just have to use them uh, in in ways that are not going to get you in hot water. Um, so I mentioned Harvard Business Review, and I wanted to be a little bit careful uh, making my own claims about what you can do with things like that, or mm-hmm. if a celebrity talks about, yeah. you know, if if uh, I don't know. Um, but let's say let's say tomorrow. Oh, I don't want to choose a politician. Let's say tomorrow Elon Musk says, um, but. Uh, everybody who's serious about a work from home career should become a copywriter, right? Mm -hmm. Um, What do I need to know about and how do I need to be careful when talking about celebrities and public figures in copy? Is there any major rules or principles? First of all, if you haven't compensated them, (laughs) uh, you need to, you know, in order to use their name or whatever, you need to make it clear that they're not endorsing your product. I mean, you saw, you know, Oprah endorses such and such berries for, you know, magical shakes, you know, (laughs) Oprah did not do that, you know, yeah. You know, whether or she liked the shakes or not, she just she's not endorsing somebody's product. And if she is, she's going to get paid for it. And she's and at that point in time, you're disclosing she's a compensated endorser. You know, so okay. it's it's yes. very clear that, that that's the case uh, when you're, you know, so basically you, you don't lie about them be endorsing something if they're not, they're, they're not as, as for a specific product. You know, you know, it, Elon Musk says this is saying, yeah, copyright is a great work from home opportunity is one thing. But if, you know, it, it's it, he did not say I've endorsed your copywriting 101 mastery program and, and sign up for $10,000 program to do, go through it for six weeks. You know, there's, yes. a, the, 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 there's a big difference between stating the, the abstract versus the fact the concrete endorsement of your product. Yeah. Um, and I know I'll, I'll add one little thing. I know that in some compliance heavy industries and companies that have dealt with having to manage compliance issues a lot, um, this 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 practice that's sometimes called trading on a name is completely banned. Like they won't let you in the first 500, basically above the fold copy, first 500 words of copy, they won't let you actually use public figures um, and certainly not celebrities in um, in the copy. They they want you to find a different way to to talk about it. Now this isn't copy, but it is it is from from advertising to give you an idea as to what can happen. And from a horrible example, you see okay. basketball basketball great Michael Jordan. Yes. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, Chicago a grocery store chain decided to run ads and put his likeness with a basketball in it in their ads without paying Michael Jordan as if he was a compensated endorsement of their grocery store chain. Uh, Michael yes. Jordan sued him 
for $10 million and won the case. And the reason they won the case was Michael does not entertain any potential business ventures for less than $10 million at the time the case was done. Now, he donated okay. the money to charity once he got it, but that just gives you an idea if you don't use a celebrity's name endorsing your product or service without their permission. Yeah, yeah. So be very careful there. Is there, I, I've, I've understood it that, there's, that, that there's, there's kind of a distinction between somebody who's like a celebrity or you could include like business leaders there and somebody who's uh, more of a politician or public figure. Or is this just a misperception in my mind that that is somehow different if somebody becomes a, a like a politician and talking about them? Well, um, the, the politicians, there's a lot of things as far as uh, with regards to defamation stuff. There's a higher standard for suits for that. But as far as stealing your likeness and misappropriating, casting it, for example, in a false light and using it particularly for monetary gain, there are some issues there, whether you're a public figure or not. And I will give you an example okay. on that. This one, a lady posed for uh, an attractive woman posed for a stock photography session. Nothing okay. risque, nothing risque whatsoever. These were just things, you know, for business professional and whatnot. Next thing she knows, somebody who got a license from the stock photography agency to grab her image and put it on the taxis throughout New York for a strip club advertisement. Oh, geez. <laughs> yes. And, and, and that's, she suddenly became synonymous as a, as a private individual with a strip as being a stripper. Yeah. And this to say that was not a good outcome for those who did it. Um, but that, yeah. that gives you an example of, you know, you can't just hijack even a private person. You know, in this yeah. case, you know, you know, nobody would have known her name. Yeah. So so basically, don't say that any 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 organization, entity or person endorses your stuff or your methods or whatever without that actually being true. And um, if if there is a paid endorsement involved making sure you paid them and making sure that you disclosed that. And it's not the only payment. I mean, it could be a relationship. Let's say, for example, you have, you know, let's say, for example, your brother-in-law happens to be David Garfinkel. Yeah. And David Garfinkel comes over and endorses your product. Yeah. It needs to be disclosed, that material connection between you. Okay. I mean, otherwise, there, there's an omission of a key fact there that may influence why David endorsed your product. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, so there is this, there's this practice and it comes up a lot in the direct response world of, of telling like a fictionalized story in mm -hmm. copy, often including, um, some kind of pseudonym. So let's say I find a, a story of somebody, um, like a, you know, some weight loss story or some story that related to weight loss on Reddit, you know, just somebody mm -hmm. posting on a public forum. So I decide I'm going to retell this story. And I'm going to not use their name. Um, how much of this falls under advertising license? How much of this is legal, illegal? Um, you know, what can, and 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 what can we do about it, or how can we how can we do this in a way where we're not exposing ourselves? You know, some of some of it obviously is very fact specific as to what you're saying. You know, you know, is it actually, you know, are you ripping off somebody's story where they could be readily identified, for example? Uh, yes. Know, um, the biggest thing, as far as it's concerned, using you know a story or even using pseudonyms or this type of thing is, as long as it's not really for false or deceptive purposes, or impersonation okay. for or impersonation, for example, that would be another big one that would be an issue. But you know, false or you know false purposes, misrepresenting key facts in order to make your sale, that's where you're going to get into trouble with these type of things. You know, you know a good story. You know, you know, you know, say, let's call this person Sue, you know, you, you know, you can, you can put these type of things like th that in there and, 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 and talk all about Sue and her life or whatever. And the reader generally understands that you, to protect anonymity and the rest of it, you're not going to be disclosing the person's name. But the minute you go off the, the reservation and start lying about the person and the facts that you're, you're on here in order to make the sale, that's where you start getting into the false and deceptive issues. Yeah, yeah. So if you're if you're inspired by a story, if you find a way to retell it and it's not and it's not specifically um, it, it's not specific enough to uh, incriminate um, it, whether it's criminal or not, but to incriminate yeah. the, the, the source of the story and, and well, identify as long them. as it's accurately represented. Like you can't take a Reddit story yeah. like, oh, I had this weight loss problem um, and take that story. And then that same person also 
uh, bought your weight loss supplement and lost yeah. 60 pounds, right? Like, um, but unless, but unless, that's, be, unless that's in the Reddit story and you can back it up, that's, you know, yeah, if, if yeah. they wrote the Reddit, yeah, but other than that, no. Okay. So, so clearly there's a lot of, and, and I mean, there, so there's a, there's a cost, there's a real cost to getting this wrong people. Um, like for example, inside the, um, the financial advice industry, there was this, this big operation over the last few years called Operation Income Illusion. And a lot of people got in a lot of trouble with various federal agencies um, because they were not listening to the type of advice that Mike Young, that Mike Young gives, right? Like, um, so, so it's worth working with compliance and legal. And I've done it for, I've done it. I mean, as soon as I got into financial copywriting, it's like compliance just becomes part of the process, right? Um, so how can copywriters and lawyers or compliance departments best work together? And this is something that you've done for plenty of clients. How can they best work together to ensure like the best results of the marketing without getting in that kind of legal trouble? What I like to do, for example, I do a compliance review is to say, look, you know, here are the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Here's the things you're doing right. Do more of it. You know, as a copywriter, yeah. we like this, you know, it, Take, you know, mark it down, but, you know, frame it, whatever, use this as often as possible. Other things, it's like, well, it's kind of like a, you know, it's kind of like, it's, it's a risk, you know, yeah. but, you know, and it needs to be, a, you know, informed risk, but here it is here. And you made to make a business judgment risk, whoever it happens to be that makes the final call on this as to whether they go forward or not, understand here are the pros and cons and how you do it. And then the, the last category is the ugly, and that's the don't do this, please don't do this. Never, never, ever, ever, ever do this. And I will give you an example on that. Um, I had a client in a particular industry that uh, is, you know, I, I was saying that to don't do this. And lo and behold, the FTC just came after a competitor and uh, took took the competitor down for making the claims that they should not have been making their copy. And um, I think the judgment was for $53 million against them. They have to refund all of their customers. They don't have the money to repay their customers. And they're, they've already, they're going to confiscate $3 million on the upfront. And they find out there's any more assets, they may take those as well. Ouch. And that's yeah. and it was not a client of mine, but it was, it was in the same, same industry of these are the types of things. And we've already discovered some of the things that they did wrong as far as uh, monetary claims. They were making monetary claims that should never have been made on, you know, in any type of direct response marketing. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of like a, a green light, yellow light, red light situation. Exactly. For, for claims and copy, like, oh, you have a green light to make this claim as often as you want. Um, this one is a yellow light. This one's a definite red light. And so as, as copywriters, it's best to like be open. I mean, I can get grumpy about feedback, but I feel like whenever it's been legal feedback, I I need to remind myself that there are certain things not to get grumpy about. Um, and, and there's a few things on there as far as like a judgment risk on the yellow thing that actually I've had some clients that have said it actually converts better when, they, when it's pulled out. And I'll give you examples on that. It's like, you know, okay. you know. We have the absolute best software in the world to do X. Well, do yeah. you really? No, yeah. you, you may, you know, pull out, you know, it's, it's not those absolutes that a person will put in there. That's it, Yeah, it may be sales puffery, but at some point the customer looks at it or prospect looks at it and goes, you've gone over the top. You've, you've, you've said way too much about your product or service. I don't believe you. So pulling that out, it, which would be like a yellow category, you know, yeah. on a yellow light category, you know, tends to actually help the copy convert better. It's there's a reminder there that credibility and candor are part of what actually gets people to respond to advertising. And a lot of what is required to make something compliant, whether from a legal perspective or from whatever compliance department may be reviewing the copy, increases the credibility and candor, right? Yes. And I mean, and it's, it's the, the damage, you know, the, the limited damage is your mission that helps you out, you know, it's, you yeah. know. You know, you, you know, you admit X, yeah, this is true, but on the other hand, here's how it benefits you to understand what I've just disclosed. Yeah, and something like, you know, this is the absolute best software in, to accomplish X, Y, Z. Um, you, like one of the things that I like to do on compliance and legal edits is to actually go back to the, the team who's editing um, or suggesting the edits and say, can I say this this way? So I might take something like that and instead of this is the absolute best software to do this, it's like, we built this software from the ground up to accomplish this goal. 
And, um, and we think that it does that very well. And here's some customer reviews that support it doing that very well. And we encourage you to try it and see how it works for you. Like that kind of um, edit. And usually the legal team is like, yeah, that's, that's great Absolutely. because we're no longer saying it's the best, right? Absolutely. Um, and so, hopefully your hopefully your legal team understands copyrighted after they can make some suggestions on it of you know <laughs> you know flip out this word or phrase with this and you know we, we like this if you are you agree to it. They're not saying if they're yeah. not writing the copy for you, but you know, if they understand copyright, they could say, here's a couple of other ways you might approach it. You know, will any of these work for you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think someone like you who has some experience doing copywriting for for your own business, you probably provide clients uh, a strong advantage in that regard versus, for example, I mean, at some of the bigger companies, you get a compliance department and there's somebody at the top who who has the legal expertise to define policies, but then you get somebody who's like a paralegal who's given a list of policies and they're very like by the book yeah. and they just say, nope, can't do that. And, and then there can be some frustration there. Um, so it, it, it pays to, uh, I don't know, to work with good people. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's see here. I think, I think what makes the most sense at this point is just to make sure that people, uh, go deeper into your work and figure out where they can learn more. So we, we talked a little bit about the bulletproof your copywriting book, uh, previously, and, and it's available on Amazon. It's quick to download, quick to read. You, you call it the quick legal guide series. So saying quick a few times. 12 sales copy legal dangers and how to avoid them. I'll make sure to include a link to that. But you do you do more with um not just not just copywriters, but with um especially online entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um can you can you speak to um some of that if somebody wants is you know listening to this and is interested in in making sure that they're uh, as protected as possible? Yeah, I, I first started representing online clients back in 1994, believe it or not, back in the Stone Ages. You know, that's uh, that's the year that Ken McCarthy did the system or, or his first online marketing conference, actually, in Silicon Valley. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I was yeah. a, a cyber mall back then. A cyber mall was a, you know, basically one website where they would sell static HTML web pages to doctors, dentists, lawyers, et cetera, for five wow. or ten thousand dollars. You could get one web page. <sighs> And that was your that was in your cyber mall. That was that was your store online. Couldn't buy anything, nothing else. It basically had your address and phone number. Oh, man. Um, so I started that was that was my first experience of that. But since then, obviously, things have gone, you know, a, a lot more than that. We do website compliance, you know, help, helping people buy and sell websites, that type of thing, you know, related to SaaS, you know, SaaS and whatnot, as far as doing membership agreements and subscriptions and a lot of things of that nature have come along with it. And copywriting is what I got involved with part of it because an essential part of buying and selling online obviously is direct response marketing. Yes. Absolutely. Um, so they can learn more about those services, including like you do, you, you also have a copywriter protection package. Um, yeah. Can you explain what that is? I was, I was a little curious about that. Yeah, we have yeah, several different ones of those protections. If you go on the website, you can take a look at them, you know, NDAs, you know, as far as being able to use that, some prospects use as part of their marketing, you know, they don't even, they get one that already, if, if go, go, the copywriter favors the copywriter to begin with, and you present it to them as part of the pitch, you know, it's like, I'm going to keep your information confidential, and it, and it looks much more professional than, hey, let's just go discuss things. Uh, it actually put, put, it shifts the burden automatically to, I'm a professional, and I want to discuss with you your project, and let's talk about it, and I'm willing to sign this NDA. Um, yeah, you know, and then of, of course, uh, co yeah, copywriting uh, agree agreements as far as you know, uh, with regards to doing it as a from a freelance basis, whether you're doing it to an entity or as an individual, um, doing it uh, on, as an independent contractor, not a, not Excellent. the employment agreements, and yeah, that you know, either whether a single project for somebody or on or on an ongoing basis, multiple projects, yes. Um, so certainly they can they can learn more about those services through yeah. your website. I'll include the link to the copywriter protection packages as well as just to your main website. Yeah. Um, but you know, number one, kind of no matter who you are, if you're a copywriter um, or an entrepreneur who's writing copy or in charge of the copy that's going out the door, the 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 twelve legal dangers and how to avoid them in the bulletproof your copywriting book um, are absolutely key. I mean, they're in there for a reason, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, Mike, I really appreciate you coming on here uh, for this interview for this episode. Um, so thank you very much for for sharing your expertise with us. 
Well, thank you, Roy. I appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. And if there's any yes. follow-up questions anybody have, uh, feel free to email me at mike at mikeandlaw.com. Excellent. Thank you so much. And to yeah. all the listeners and viewers who've um, who've listened and viewed this episode, I appreciate you as well. Thank you for uh, for sticking with it. And I, I strongly encourage you to, uh, to, to gain a strong understanding and to reach out for help when necessary of the legal compliance issues with copywriting, because it is critically important and you don't want to end up in hot water when you don't have to. Um, and, and so check out Mike's additional resources there. Thank you. And I will catch you again in the next episode. See you soon. Thank you once again for tuning in to this daily episode of Breakthrough Marketing Secrets. Remember, check out the links with this episode for even more value. Now make sure you like, comment, share, subscribe, and engage in every way you can to keep this show going and growing and delivering daily value to you. I'll catch you soon for your next big breakthrough.